Hello everyone, Modular Workspaces 1.8 is now available and this supports Blender 4.3 and hopefully Blender 4.3.1, which has just been released adding a bunch of fixes. If you're new here and you don't know what Modular Workspaces is, it's one of my add-on products intended to simplify the process of importing collection assets into Blender and automatically unpacking them, organizing them into collections. And it also adds a whole bunch of convenience features like being able to add buttons to let you split your interface and we also have hotkeys for Pi menus and stuff like that. So what's new in this update? First First of all, we've got a bunch of fixes. The code has been cleaned up. There was an issue with renaming objects where when unpacking collection assets, I had a feature to automatically trim that annoying .001 off of the names. That stopped working a couple of versions back because Blender changed the renaming functionality. We now have quick access support for the asset shelf. So we've got a hotkey for that, which I'll show you on the interface. And we've got some experimental filtering features as well. So you can control what appears in the asset shelf. Another change we made is that now the add-on is technically an extension type. Now this may be confusing. Well, the difference between an add-on and an extension. Well, recently the Blender team made an extensions platform, which is a way for people to automatically update their add-ons online. Modular Workspaces is not actually part of that platform, but to get used to the practice of making things compatible with this new system, Modular Workspaces is now technically an extension type, which kind of modernizes it in some way. You install it very, very similarly to how you would an add-on. In fact, the way you install add-ons typically still works now, but I'll just show you if I go to edit preferences and you see we've got these two sections get extensions and add-ons. You can install modular workspaces 1.8 in two ways. Firstly, the old way is by going to add-ons. Then if we go to this drop-down now and install from disk, go to where you downloaded the add-on zip file. You'll notice that when you do get the product, there are two zip files. One of them says add-on and one says library. Obviously this one is the add-on and this is the asset library, which you can install separately. If we choose the add-on zip file and press install from disk, it will add it in the add-ons list. But also interestingly, if you go to the get extensions tab and then look under installed, you will see modular workspaces has appeared in here as well. You'll also notice that if you look at it under add-ons, you can't remove it from here like you can do with other add-ons. See, I've got machine tools installed and you can uninstall it from here because Blender knows it's an extension. So you have to go to it in the extensions tab and then press the drop down and then uninstall. So I've restarted my Blender now and just to show you the other way, if we go to get extensions, press the drop down and then install from disk again, and then choose the zip file and it will also be added. So you can use either way to install it now. It's just one thing to keep in mind. After it's been installed, when we're in the 3D view, if I press N on my keyboard to bring up the side panel, we'll see the workspaces tab. Now for people that are new, let's have a quick walk through the features. Some of the interface will be open by default and some of it will be closed. So to reiterate the point of the add-on, first and foremost, if I clear the file, is to help with managing collection assets. The asset browser in Blender is a feature that allows you to store a whole bunch of different types of data and objects and other types of useful bits and bobs in Blender in Blend files and then be able to access them from other Blend files from your dropdown. So see, I've got my modular metals pack, procedural patterns, which involves materials and node groups, afterglow, got a whole bunch of stuff there. So it's a useful way of recycling your content. Typically to access this, you'd have to split the interface and then find the asset browser, which would be over here. And then notice that the thumbnails are by default quite a large size. And then you'd have to choose your favorite library manually. So basically just getting to the asset browser takes quite a few clicks. Modular Workspaces gives you a couple of ways to access it quickly. So first of all, you may notice that there are new buttons up here. These buttons are toggle buttons. So if you press them, they'll turn the interface that it's splitting on and off. And one of the great things is these aren't hard coded. You can customize these buttons to anything you like. So if we go down to the toggle section of the interface, you'll see left, top, right, and bottom area. So the bottom area would be the asset browser. We can enable and disable that button. We can make it so it's the icon only if you wanna keep it condensed. And you can also change the name to anything else. So if I type in something, it will become something. So you're effectively customizing the split functionality. If you remove the name, it will just go back to what the editor actually is. So in this case, it's an asset browser. You can choose the type from the list. So if I want it to be a compositor, then the compositor will open instead. I'm gonna reset that to the asset browser. And you can also change the percentage size that the editor will open at. But note, it can't go higher than 45. It's because of a way that the uh, splitting functionality works in the Python API for Blender. If it goes further than that, then it will just split on the wrong side of the interface, which is a bit weird, but that's how it works. 
They might have changed that by now, but that's how it's been for several versions now. More so than this, under the Asset Browser Settings panel here, you can choose the default size that you want the thumbnails to appear in the Asset Browser when they open. You can also enter the name of the asset library you want to open by default. So if I open that again, you'll notice that the size of the thumbnails is on 50, because that's what I've set as my preference, and it opens up on my modular workspaces library asset file, which you can see here. This is a quick way to access things. I'm just going to set the open size back down to 20 again to make that a bit tidier. You may also notice that under the toggles here, we've got a pie menu section. This is quite clever, and this is thanks to my co-partner on this now, Gixx who has contributed so much time to working on the add-on. If I press Alt and Space by default, then we're going to get the buttons up here, but in a pie menu. And they're also in the appropriate direction. So we'll notice that the bottom area, which we knew was Asset Browser, is also Asset Browser on the bottom of the pie menu. So I can use the pie menu to open and close. So you can do like quick flicks of the mouse to split the area however you've designed. One thing to note though, is that again, because of a bit of a weird quirk with the user focus when splitting the interfaces, if you wanna flick down, sometimes that will work, but sometimes you will have to manually click, like just moving the cursor down and letting go won't do it. Notice that after the asset browser closes, then we stop being able to flick, so we have to click. That wasn't always the case, but again, Blender API changes cause behaviors to change. So we don't have a workaround for that yet, but I'm just letting you know that's a thing. You may also notice that when certain things are open, then other options become unavailable. You see that the buttons are grayed out. Again, this wasn't always the case, but Blender API changes introduce new problems. So if you start splitting things horizontally and then you want to split vertically afterwards, then you won't be able to do that anymore. You have to close the horizontal one and then split vertically. So it's just a little limitation. We just keep that in mind, but you can always, you know, just undo them and then go back to the horizontal ones. It'd be nice if that wasn't the case, but we have to work around how the dev team are changing the API. Now for this pie menu, you can change what you want the hockey to be. So I like doing mouse button four, which I believe is here. And if I remove alt, if I press the back button on my mouse, then I can, you know, flick up and down and change what I want. Now, we also have this kind of hotkey setup system, but for the asset shelf. One thing to keep in mind, though, is this only works if the asset shelf is present in the scene or can be accessed because there are only a few places where you can access the asset shelf. We would like it to be available everywhere, but that's just kind of how it works. So if I make a object here and then go into sculpt mode, you see that we've got the asset shelf down here and I've got the hotkey set to shift alt and D. So if I press that, then we can toggle it on and off. And again, you can change that to whatever you like. So again, you can kind of customize this as you're using shift alt and D. I'm using my mouse forward to like open and close different editor windows. So if you have specific workflows, then you can decide how to set that up. We do actually have more advanced settings for the asset shelf, but to access these because they're experimental, you go to edit preferences, then under add-ons because it doesn't appear under extensions. If you go to add-ons, modular workspaces, you will see experimental features. Click on custom asset shelves and you will notice a new area appear in the interface. So this is hidden by default because again, the asset shelf is an underdeveloped feature in Blender. It's not present in many places and it's got inconsistent behaviors when it comes to drag and dropping. The idea behind the asset shelf settings is that you can make configurations so that when you open the asset shelf in specific editors and workspaces, it will automatically show different things. So if you're in a custom pipeline or workflow, you'll know that as soon as you open the asset shelf with the configuration you've set up, then it will show only what you want to see, really. Now, there are already filter features that come with the asset shelf, but again, they're a bit limited. Now, here's a weird thing. So if I go back to object mode, now the asset shelf is in the scene. So if I open it now, I can access pretty much everything. So if I go to modular workspaces library, we can see the content here and I can press my shift or one D. Weirdly, remember, I couldn't open it before we went into sculpt mode and now I can open it. Now we've gone in and then back out. So bit weird. Now remember, this is an experimental feature, but if you wanted to give it a try, we can name the config. So let me say like 3D workflow, the space type, I'm in the 3D viewport. I want it to work in pretty much all modes. So I'm not going to add an exception for the mode like editing or grease pencil or whatever. Workspace is 3D view, but I want to be able to access the shelf anywhere. And maybe I just wanted to show me materials. I forgot I need to press the plus there to add it just so it saves materials, right? So now if I open the asset shelf, it's only showing materials. And then if I remove the material filter and save, 
then it's showing everything again. Now this may be a bit confusing to understand. It's basically a way for you to customize and set up filters for the asset shelf. Now, because again, the asset shelf is kind of underdeveloped at this point, it's still a new feature. This may or may not be useful for you. And the API around it is likely to change. And like we said, it's a bit weird how you have to get the shelf in the scene before you can actually start using it, but it's something we'll play with over time. And then you can remove a config, but now because the asset shelf is gone, I can't open it again. So that's why it's an experimental feature. I wouldn't usually let you know about it, but if you want to play around and test a bit, then you can. So I'm going to disable that and we'll move on. Okay, now let's move on to the asset library. So as we saw earlier, there are two main downloads. There's the add-on zip file and the library zip file. I'm using the program 7-zip to open this. You can use anything you like to open the zip file. Pretty much every operating system should support it. Inside of the library zip file, there is a folder called modular workspaces library. Inside of here is the asset library content. Now, I need to emphasize this because it doesn't matter how many times I tell people not to try installing the library as an add-on, people still try and do it. Even though it's a zip file, you don't install the asset library like an add-on. You do not go to edit preferences add-ons and try and install it that way. Instead, open the zip file and extract this folder somewhere on your computer. It can be anywhere you like. So go to it now on your computer. This is the asset library. They're not installed through Blender, they're installed by you. You put them anywhere on your device you like. Then take a note of this directory. I'm gonna copy the directory. Then go to edit, preferences, file paths. Now I've got a bunch of asset libraries set up. I'm actually just gonna remove all of them to simplify this. By default, you may have no asset libraries there. And if I check the asset browser, my file is a bit confused now because I've messed up everything, but you may just have have like the default essentials that come with Blender. So to add the asset library that you extracted, press the plus button, and then I have pasted in the directory that I copied. Notice that it says no items, that's fine. All we're doing is giving Blender the directory, then press add asset library. So now it knows to look in the folder we've provided. Down in the asset browser, I'm going to press the refresh button and then the drop down, then we'll see that modular workspaces library is there. If I click on it, then we have the content. So what's effectively happening is Blender is now looking at the directory we copied, which is where we extracted the library. The asset library is comprised of a few files. These two text files define the categories because I have pre-set up categories for different types of content. So if you wanna use the categories, then that's there. And there is a single blend file which contains the content. So what content is included? It's a bunch of collection assets to help you speed up getting your scene set up. So for example, if I drag in a basic camera and a light catcher and moody lighting, and then press the unpack setup button. Before I do that, notice we have three collection assets. And when I press unpack, they are all unpacked. So we've got the camera, three lights, light catcher and a sphere object, and they are automatically organized into collections, which are named the type of object they are. If I go into my rendered view now, you'll see we already have a lighting setup ready to go. We started from an empty scene with nothing, and now we have an organized setup ready to modify however we like with lights preset in there. Some of these presets are actual collection assets that you drag into the scene. So for example, if I remove these lights and then I'm gonna to go to studio lighting and unpack that, we see we've got a different lighting setup. Some of them are more complicated and some of them are much more simple. For example, the camera is literally just one camera object. The test donut is just a donut object, but the view tunnel is more complex. It's an object with a material that simulates a medium like being underwater. If I clear the file, the diorama collection is a whole bunch of things in one. It's a camera, it's an object, it's a different kind of lighting setup just to make something interesting. There are node groups as well. So if I go to the world nodes category, just to make this easier to understand. If I go for the altitude node group, see there's low, medium and high altitude. If I take this and plug it into the surface, then we're kind of simulating a skyscape there. You can look into the node group and see that it's a Nishita sky texture. Same thing with low altitude as well. So these are just ways to kind of speed things up. We've got a star field one. If I plug that in, it will give us a quick star field background. We've got like gradients. You can get different gradient colors for the background as well. So there are all different things you can explore here. The most complicated ones come from a character lighting update I did a while ago. It's maybe a little bit of a precursor towards the Afterglow product work. The intention was to give people highly customizable presets that they could put 
characters or other types of stylized things in to nicely render them. Now, I believe this content does also need a bit of an update, so I need to get around to that because the behavior of lights has changed. So if I drag in the Murtos preset and then unpack that, you'll notice we've got a few weird artifacts in here, but I'm going to explain why they're there. If I take a monkey head and then subdivide that, put that in here, there's like a spatial ring of light here where your character would stand. Now, this weird stuff down here is happening because at some point after the content was added the behavior of lights changed and it's to do with radiuses so if i find the spotlight down here and then reduce the radius value to nothing you'll see it stops that from happening so if we reduce the radius of all the point and spotlights then it removes that artifact also this cone of light was not as visible before so that can be moved so even though the lighting in this case needs to be updated for blender 4.3 if you're using it before i get around to that it's still useful you just need to adjust the radius values i recommend watching the original video about it because it goes into the design of what all the objects are, how to modify the volumetric options. Uh, that's another thing as well. So every lighting preset has a world node that accompanies it that adjusts the volume and color to give you more control over the lighting. So let me turn the volume density up a bit, adjust the camera, and you can see how this is like the starting point for a character display. You can imagine some kind of cool creature there. If I click on the object labeled energy, energy is the name of the ring that tends to be on the bottom of all the presets, which has a emission material on it. Um, for which we can modify and change that. So see if I change that to blue, then we get a different style. So again, these presets aren't necessarily a very beginner friendly thing, especially since there's a bit of a modification that you would do after the fact, but they are there and I'll try to make them a bit more user friendly in the future. Let's give you a more friendly preset to work with. If I go for a shadow catcher, so it's basically an invisible object that catches shadows, a test donut and a camera. And then if I remove that world node, I'm gonna go for like the low altitude one, Put that in then unpack the setups you'll see now that as i rotate around we've got a different kind of scene if i go into the camera view we've got some atmosphere we've got an object and an invisible object catching the shadow there so this is like another kind of generic but a nice starting point for rendering again this would also be great for character setups because you'd get a shadow coming off the character standing there so like i said there's a mix of complexity and simplicity but they're all just supposed to be starting points if you like starting from something extremely simple and working from there you can if you like starting from something hyper stylized and having fun with adjusting the values you can do that as well importantly though you don't have to use any of these assets the unpacking functionality works with any collection asset so the point is you would design your own asset libraries if you like or say you're working in a team that's using an asset library for your pipeline that's compatible with that basically any collection asset that contains objects this will help to unpack it and i've got extra features here to help you customize how they're unpacked for example if i remove the test donut and if i bring the view tunnel in and unpack that typically with the view tunnel you wouldn't use it in an environment where you've got a sky background so if I remove that node group and I'm going to add a new light source. So again, for this view tunnel, let's say we're simulating underwater. So we're looking through a water medium. If I increase that to like 1000 strength or something, we'll notice that this view tunnel isn't super useful because it doesn't stick with the camera. That's because I didn't have keep parent and keep hierarchy ticked when I unpacked it because this is effectively a parent child rig. So let me clear the file again, bring in the view tunnel. This time if I click keep parent and keep hierarchy and then unpack, again, I'm gonna make a light. This time I'll do a spot one actually make that stronger. Then if I move the camera around, we are constantly in the volume because the volume moves with the camera, as we can see here. So if you do have objects to have this parent-child hierarchy, make sure you tick those so that they unpack properly. So in this case, the volume is preserved and we can make use of the effects. Now in this case, I've just thrown a Suzanne monkey into the mix to show you why a view tunnel like this is useful, because it's quite a weird thing to explain to someone that's you know never done something like this, but it's a bit of an experimental rendering method to uh, simulate a different kind of medium, because you're actually looking through a material surface and volume to get an effect. So yeah, Modular Workspaces is available on Gumroad and Blender Market. We recently had the Black Friday sale, which already ended, so I apologize for that. We do it every year though. I will also say that the community member that's been helping me with keeping this add-on updated, Gixo, I've now added as a permanent contributor so they will get a percentage of every sale that we make as well. This felt like the right kind of thing to do because they kept giving me help with the add-on and then I kept trying to offer them money, they kept turning it down, but finally I've convinced them to accept having a percentage. So if you are interested and 
and you don't already have it, consider picking up a copy. You'll be supporting both of us and I hope you find it useful. So yeah, if you made it to the end of this video, we have a tradition on my channel where if you put an emoji in the comments, it will signal to me that you did make it to the end. So today we're going to do a wrench emoji or any other kind of tool. And if you put that in the comments, I'll understand. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.